I'm delighted to see you all here today. Humanities Day is one of my favorite things about the University of Chicago, so welcome to it. I'm Hans Saucy, and I'm going to be talking about Madame Bovary in Haiti. And uh, first, I, I would uh, you know, like to admit that I'm not a, a specialist in Haiti. I'm a person who uh, lives in fascination with Haiti. This has been going on for 40 or so years. Uh, through friendships and other things. I've started going down there and have tried to keep up with things and read as widely as I can in, uh, in Haitian literature. Um, you may know I, what I do for, for my paycheck is actually teaching Chinese literature. And, you know, China, Haiti, not the same place. But Haiti is a small and complicated place. It definitely will repay your attention. Uh, it uh, as you know, it's, uh, it's a country, it's the only country, as far as I know, to have uh, emer emerged as a, a self-governing unit from a slave revolt. Uh, and Haitians are very conscious of that. Let's just launch in. So I'm going to be talking about Jean Prisse Mars, a, uh, a writer who, um, whose career spanned essentially the teens to the 50s of, of uh, the last century. His, uh, he was a doctor, he was also a diplomat. He spent uh, several years as uh, ambassador in Washington, and he had had postings in Berlin and elsewhere before that. Um, his uh, his uh, several books, uh, I'm, of his several books, I've pulled out just two to talk about today. I'm really going to be talking about two words in one of those books. Uh, the two words that made a, a definite effect, that had a definite effect on Haitian cultural life. But I want to mention some of the other ones. Um, it's good to have some, some dates in mind. Uh, the United States occupied Haiti from 1916 to 1934. Uh, the uh, the uh, reason that they gave for sending in the Marines was social unrest, but I think they were also anxious to deny uh, the Germans any deep water harbors in the Caribbean. So the same reasoning, I think, applies to why uh, the U.S. bought Denmark uh, peacefully, in that case, from, uh, sorry, bought the, uh, the Virgin Islands from Denmark peacefully, in that case, in, in 1917. Uh, so at any rate, the Marines disembarked in 1916, and they stayed for quite a while. Um, occupying the country and ruling it uh, with, with a kind of a, a shadow Haitian government. Right? Um, this, uh, this is uh, an event that is known in Haitian literary culture as the slap, la gifle. Uh, and Jean Prismaus is one of the people who was, who was most conscious of the slap. In what way was it a slap? Well, when the Marines arrived, uh, they made no distinction between Haitians of the elite uh, governing class and Haitians of the poorest class. To these Marines, they were all black and they could all be sent to repair the roads or do whatever the Marines thought needed to be done. And Prismaus, who was a medical doctor and had been a diplomat, was unused to this kind of treatment, right? As were all the other uh, highly educated Haitians. Um, one of the reasons of the complexity of Haiti is that it's a country where three to five percent of the population uh, speaks and writes French and participates in, in an international culture in that way. The other 95 or 97 percent speaks Creole, which did not have a publishing tradition at the time of, uh, of Jean Prismaus. Uh, so uh, Prismaus in 1917 and 18 wander, uh, roamed around the country, traveled around Haiti, speaking at various literary circles and culture clubs and so on about the situation of the elite, of the educated uh, fraction of the Haitian population under U.S. occupation, right? What can they do? Uh, is, it, uh, is it more advisable to collaborate and try to do things in the hope that they would prove constructive Right, to do things uh, together with the American-imposed administration, or should they resist? There was a very active peasant resistance, uh, and, uh, which was supp suppressed uh, quite bloodily by the, uh, by the Marines. Uh, 
And so out of his conversations with different groups in Haiti came this little book, La Vocation de l'Elite, which is fascinating, but I'm not really talking about that so much today. I'm talking mostly about Ainsi par la l'oncle, which is usually translated as Thus spoke the, ankle, the uncle or so, so spoke the uncle. I think there's a little joke of a Zarathustra allusion here, right? Ainsi par la Zarathustra, Nietzsche's great book, as it's known in, in French. And so Ainsi par la l'oncle is kind of, you know, it's a, the idea is that this is a book that in some way is a ventriloquism. Uh, he's speaking on behalf of someone who you know, might be a kind of a prophet or a person possessed of, of ancient and deep wisdom, which, he's, which Prismaus is handing over to the public. Ainsi par la l'oncle is a book about Haitian folklore. It collects a lot of stories, uh, a lot of you know, animal fables and uh, trickster stories and all kinds of things that Prismaus collected in the countryside as he wandered around uh, Haiti. Uh, not just talking to the elite literary circles, but talking to you know, farmers and, and other people uh, in Creole. And both of his books, uh, both of his major books are in French, not in Creole. So they're addressed to this small fraction of the country, talking about subjects related to you know, Haitian peasant life, but not uh, specifically addressed to the peasants themselves. Uh, and so in, in this book of Haitian folklore, uh, in the preface to this book, he accuses his compatriots of bovarisme collectif, right? And these are the two words that I'll be uh, scrutinizing today and putting in their context. Collective bovarisme. Um, what does he mean by collective bovarisme? Uh, well, the book itself, uh, as I say, it's mostly composed of folklore, uh, and his preface is a bit of a challenge to the French-speaking fraction of Haiti, uh, telling them that they need to pay more attention to peasant life and folklore and vodou. Right? Uh, you can't mention Haiti without thinking about vodou, right? the, the syncretic religion developed by Haitians, mostly during the 40 or so years when the Catholic Church was not sending any missionaries there, right? the years immediately after the, the Haitian Revolution, when people were just going their own way and uh, constructing new theologies on, on a kind of a syncretic basis. So here, here is Prismaus uh, talking about Haitian culture in general in his preface. He says, uh, after 1804, right, after the revolution, the black community of Haiti adopted the mannerisms of Western civilization, right? Revêtit la défroc. It's kind of a, a, kind of a dismissive kind of way of speaking of, of uh, of this uh, enterprise, and ever since, with a determination unperturbed by any failure, sarcasm, or accident, they labored to draw near to their former colonial center, to make themselves like it, to identify themselves with it. An absurd and grandiose mission, as difficult a mission as ever existed. Right? So he's pointing out the absurdity of Haitians uh, wanting to write as good Frenchmen, right? wanting to write good French and write in ways that would be accepted by French people. And that was kind of an ideal. Um, to mention a few of these writers, by the way, uh, the, these are not negligible people. Uh, Antenor Firmin, uh, who was another uh, Haitian diplomat sent to Paris, uh, wrote a, an important book in the 1870s called De l'égalité des races humaines, which is a direct response to Gobineau's on the inequality of human races. So he you know, throws it right back at him and writes a scientific and philosophical tome on the equality of, of human races. And Firmin was also a poet who wrote in the most classic uh, Alexandrian style, you know, a little bit like Sully Prudhomme, let's say, or, or Victor Hugo, right, one of the uh, very canonical 19th century French poets. And he writes historical poetry about uh, Haitian history. Uh, and, and so, but absolutely on French models. So coming back now to Prismaus in 1928, he says, uh, so, okay, the, the Haitians, they were setting themselves this impossible task of writing and living a cultural life like Frenchmen who were probably not interested in what the Haitians were doing for the most part. Uh, so 
uh, Prismars continues, he says, but this is precisely the curious behavior that Monsieur de Gautier in his metaphysics names collective bovarisme, that is, the aptitude of a society to imagine itself other than it is. To the degree that we forced ourselves to believe that we were colored Frenchmen, we simply forgot how to be Haitians, that is, people born under specific historical conditions, right? So this is where he's making his appeal to the public that what they need to do is be Haitians, right? To shed this fake French identity that they've adopted for themselves, to realize that it's not going to work, and to become something different, right? To take, uh, to take Haitian culture as their model. All right. Um, so let's pause here for a moment, right? Because this is a gesture that's been made many times in history. Uh, it's very familiar from 18th century Europe, right? You think of people like Herder and Hamann uh, addressing the German nation and saying, stop imitating French people, right? This neoclassical drama that, the, that you're trying to write in imitation of Racine or Voltaire, forget it. It's not what's with our roots. You need to look at Shakespeare, for example, that uh, rule-free rule genius. You know, this is what Germans need to do, imitate Shakespeare, who gives you a, a less prescriptive model for how to write drama. And you need to plunge into the folklore and the mythology of the North and so on. So uh, Herder and company were trying to kick off a, sort of a cultural revolution, if I can use that phrase, for the German-speaking world. Later on in the 19th century, you, know, you have different cultural nationalisms where uh, the, the Belarusians or the Czechs or others uh, begin to delve into their local musical traditions, artistic traditions, uh, fairy tales, and so forth, and build cultural objects out of those rather than adopting a neoclassical model, right? Essentially a Greek and Roman model, but filtered through French hands, as these things tend to be. Uh, somehow the French are always the bad guys in these nationalistic stories. Uh, the Russians, too, you know, they are completely under the sway of French culture, and in War and Peace, Tolstoy kind of pokes fun at that, right? And again, like Pris Miles is reminding his countrymen, you're never going to be Frenchmen. You know, I mean, the Parisians don't even accept people who are born 20 miles out of Paris as Parisians. So, you know, if you're born in Moscow, you can just give up. Uh, so, anyway, it's, it's this gesture then of calling on people to uh, turn, turn inwards, to, to put aside this uh, hollow uh, cultural identity that's taken from other people and to do something on a local basis, right? Uh, it's a gesture made many times, but what's, uh, what's our subject today is this uh, recruitment of Madame Bovary as a participant in the, in the conversation. What is Madame Bovary doing here? All right, let's see. All right, so he goes on to answer his own question and say, you know, don't we have a, a reservoir of traditions and songs and stories and so forth that we, can, that we can call on, right? Wouldn't it be great if we wrote epic poems on the basis of vodou legends, for example, uh, something that was done in the 1960s by René de Pestre? Uh, um, if you're interested, uh, the, the, the poem I have in mind is called A Rainbow for the Christian West and uh, An Arc-en-Ciel pour l'Occident Chrétien. It's beautifully translated by Joan Dayan, uh, D-A-Y-A-N, uh, published in the 1970s at some point. Anyway, it's a hilarious uh, comic epic in which, uh, in which a bunch of, uh, of uh, white Americans are pursued and harangued and harassed by voodoo gods. Uh, but that would come long in the future as a result of the cultural movement that Ainsi par la l'Oncle touched off in 1928. But so here he says, you know, if there is this folklore, what's its value? How can I present it? That's the point of this book, right, is to turn one's back on bovarisme and uh, call people to pay attention to Haitians' own cultural stock, right? So he's setting up a little polarity, bovarisme versus authenticity. But as I say, what is Madame Bovary doing in all this? Okay, well, you know Madame Bovary, right? It's sort of the first of the great French, or the great European adultery novels, right, of which there are many uh, in, in several languages. Uh, so it was uh, Flaubert's first book that really made an impression on people. 
Uh, Kenneth Burke, I think, said something very wise in the 1940s about, about how literature gives us equipment for living, as he put it. And he says, you know, somebody writes a book like Madame Bovary and it becomes part of common parlance, right? People have this kind of archetype in their heads, right? Just as we do with, you know, things that we might, might have seen on TV or whatever, right? Uh, character, they become our folklore in a way, right? Characters from movies and TV and novels uh, enable us to name situations, right? So, you know, you might, uh, you might, uh, I don't know, you might invoke the characters of Breaking Bad, I'm just pulling that out of the air, uh, as examples of what happens to a certain kind of person in a certain kind of situation, right? That's what Madame Bovary does. So uh, Burke very wisely says, each work of art is the addition of a word to an informal dictionary. And with Prismas, we see it happening absolutely literally, because from the moment that he accused his fellow Haitians of collective Bovarisme, Nobody could stop talking about the Bovarisme problem. But what is the idea be behind Madame Bovary? This image I uh, shamelessly stole from a publisher's catalog that got to my inbox just yesterday. Uh, it represents a certain understanding of Madame Bovary, right? Here she is. She's, you know, her heart is inflamed with desire, but she's imprisoned in her hoop skirt standing for conventional expectations, and even, you know, by her own body becoming a kind of a cage. This is not the way 19th century people understood Madame Bovary, right? This is a version that, that takes her story to be tragic and to be one that, uh, that we can sort of put ourselves into. The way 19th century people understood it basically runs like this. Emma Bovary, she's bored by her life. She's been reading uh, these kind of schmaltzy uh, romance novels that make her think that somewhere out there, there's a handsome prince who will arrive and sweep her off her feet. And she kind of lives her life looking for that handsome prince instead of her boring husband who goes to sleep every night after the soup is finished. Uh, she takes a lover, he goes away, then she takes another. Uh, in order to make herself attractive she, and to make her house more livable for her. She borrows a lot of money and orders a lot of expensive stuff. Uh, this is even before credit cards. Uh, so she has to constantly be borrowing money from people in, in the neighborhood. And some of the notes that she's used to borrow money have her husband's forged signature on them. And so when this catches up with her, she sees no recourse but to take poison that she buys at the, uh, at the uh, apothecary shop and kill herself. Right. So the way 19th century people saw it, it's a story about illusion and how illusion is punished. Right. There's not much sympathy for Madame Bovary in, in, these, uh, in these accounts of her. Uh, there is a story that uh, Flaubert said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Right. I am Madame Bovary. And uh, we repeat this story back and forth, but I've never been able to find actual documentary evidence. I've read through his correspondence. I've read through people's memories of Flaubert. It might be one of those things that's just like an urban legend that goes around. It would be nice if he said, I'm Madame Bovary, because you know, that would get us out of this censorious reading of the novel and open up a, a path for thinking of her. Her story is representative of, of everybody, even of, uh, of the uh, bachelor author of, of this book. But apparently it didn't happen. And some people today might even say that it would be impossible for Flaubert to say, I am Madame Bovary, given this kind of climate of, of censorious reading that sets up uh, sets up Madame Bovary as a kind of a fool who is justly punished for her folly. Uh, Jules de Gautier, then 50 or so years after the publication of Madame Bovary, writes a little book called Le Bovarisme. And it's, it's a funny book. It's about the power of illusions in human life. And he says, in its pejorative meaning, Bovarisme is the fact of fashioning for oneself on the basis of a model a conception of oneself that one lacks the ability to make real. In its, so, in its favorable meaning, it is uh, the fact of fashioning a higher concept of oneself on the basis of a model together with the power to make it real. Okay. Now, Gautier is he's kind of a Nietzschean, right? He's a reader of Nietzsche who, 
uh, had already been published in French. And you know, Nietzsche is often interested in the way that people's illusions become more real than, than reality itself. So you know, you've got good bovarisme where you have an ideal and you try to live up to it, and you have the bad bovarisme where you have an ideal with absolutely no way of making that ideal happen. Right? Um, and continuing then with Gautier, the author cited by Prismas, as you remember, uh, Emma pays with her life that failure of critical sense, which consisted in believing herself other than she was, the idealist, idealistic presumption of attaining to subordinate the real to the imaginary. Right? So by invoking Bovarisme, uh, Prismas is kind of saying to other Haitians, look, we're, we're on a, a dead end, right? We are putting ourselves on a path that can only end tragically in our failure to be ourselves as well as our failure to be that idealized uh, French person that we'll never be. And so Emma's suicide might be sort of the, the maximal expression of the threat. But wait a minute, he didn't just say bovarisme. He did say bovarisme and he quoted Gautier, right, who had launched the term uh, 20 or so, 25 years before uh, Prismaus was writing his book. But he also says collective bovarisme, right? So that's a term that had occurred before too. And I think, uh, I think the real reference here is an article by Arnold van Gennep, which cites uh, Gautier, but uh, takes, it, takes Gautier's case in a different kind of direction. Uh, the reason I think it's, um, well, you'll see the reasons I think that van Gennep is probably the immediate source and that uh, Prismaus may be getting his Gautier through Van Gennep. Um, because Van Gennep, he's an anthropologist, right? kind of an armchair anthropologist. He wrote about a lot of things. He wrote about Chinese religion, for example. Uh, he wrote about the South Seas. Uh, and in this, in this piece, he sort of collects examples from all around the world, but uh, most particularly from Africa. Um, uh, cases of collective bovarisme uh, are uh, cases of cultures that adopt forms that are alien to them, according to Van Gennep. Uh, and he is particularly fascinated by Liberia, right, a country that had been uh, formed by American slaves who were repatriated to Africa and sort of sent there as a reverse colonization process. Right? They, they had a capital that with columns on the front. Uh, they wore frock coats and debated. They, you know, they, they built houses looking like American houses. They had American names. They spoke English in their, in their parliament. And this group of resettled Americans uh, was, uh, didn't have a lot in common with the people who were already living in Liberia. So Liberia is a, a very paradoxical case. Um, also a fascinating place. And the friend who brought me to Haiti in the 1980s has since been doing a lot of work in Sierra, Sierra Leone and Liberia. But to tell you about that would take us way too far off the track. Uh, Van Gennep is, uh, by the way, Van Gennep is, uh, he's, you know, he's just one of these casual, loudmouth racists that one encounters. His, I don't know if he ever went to Liberia. He's taking most of his information from journalists who, you know, visited for two days and then write their article, right, that kind of thing. Uh, he says, you know, Liberia, it's a very interesting place. They have this, you know, this capital which has ambitiously laid out avenues, but the avenues stop after two blocks. And then, you know, you have these mud holes and you have, you know, cows and goats lying on the street. Uh, there, there is one street light in Liberia. You know, repeating all this kind of you know racist stuff about you know how Africans are uh, are supposed to be incapable of having a modern society. Right. This is what the lesson that Van Gennep takes from the existence of Liberia. So you know, this is just a a blatant and open piece of, of racism. The way he he talks about the uh, the cultural hybridity as we might call it, of Liberia. Um, and he has a kind of a, a prescription. He says, 
for example, the Japanese. The Japanese have adopted a lot of Western forms, but in their souls, they are still Buddhists and Shinto and uh, samurai Bushido believers. This is what makes them strong, and the Japanese will take over the world, he says very confidently in 1908, just a couple of years as you know, after the, the uh, Japanese uh, army and navy had defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. So that was you know, sort of top of mind for a lot of people who are doing this sort of broad brush cultural theory, right? So he wants to contrast the Japanese with the Liberians. And he says, what makes the half-savage blacks of Guinea strong and fit to survive is their acceptance of themselves as they are. What makes the Liberians weak is their desire to be something other than what they are. Right? So he's applying uh, Gautier's theory to contemporary geopolitics. And he says, you know, one of these days, a general revolution would eliminate the obstacles uh, in Liberia and permit the creation from a ground up of a special Liberian ideal and a civilization. But with those quote unquote, civilized blacks, can one be sure? Look at Haiti. The remaining still half savage blacks ought to be shown the case of the Liberians so that it will stand for them as a warning not to adopt the illusion of the whites. Right, so again, this is just acting out the consequences of his racist understanding of culture, right? That Africans who do things in a European way will always fail and so they shouldn't even try, right? And Haiti, for him, is a particular case of failure. Right? Now, Antenor Firmin, for example, the, the author of The Equality of Human Races, uh, he would have had a word or two to say about this, this pattern of thinking. Right? He would have rejected it energetically. And he could have pointed to his own books as evidence in that case. You know, look, if I can write these books and, and rebut the, the most famous French racist theorists, then clearly your idea that, that skin color dictates cultural adaptability is wrong. Right? So Antenor Fiumain would have had one kind of response to this sort of argument. But ainsi par la l'oncle adopts the, uh, the gesture of saying, trying to be Europeans is futile. We'll never get there. No one will let us get there. Right? Uh, it's a text of the occupation period, right? the period of the slap, in which out on the streets of Port-au-Prince, the differences between blacks and whites were being enforced massively, right? And no black person had the rights that a white person had, right? Which was not the way things were done in Haiti after 1804, right? So in that sense, it's, uh, it's an expression of this kind of shock of reintroduced inequality. Uh, and, and this is the thing that, that uh, that I feel is, is tremendously ambiguous and even wrenching about Ainsi par la l'oncle uh, is the way that it, um, it kind of rolls with the punch, as it were, and says, okay, you know, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we can use the racist argument in a constructive way, right? Uh, maybe we should stop convincing ourselves that we are just Frenchmen who happen to be colored. Right? Um, and that I find profoundly ambiguous. The, uh, we could kind of think of the, the moment of the American occupation of Haiti uh, uh, somewhat typologically as a time of hardening boundaries. Right? I, you know, here I'm just offering a, a sort of a, a general way of speaking about these things. Right? There are times when boundaries seem to be more fluid and people's identities can change. People are in some way licensed to experiment with other versions of themselves, and there are times when boundaries imposed on people become very hard, right? And in the case of Arnold van Gennep's uh, quite racist article, you see that, the, uh, that what people are is what they are born as, and anything that they do after their birth has got to be, for him, inauthentic. Right? Um, I think that's a very pessimistic way of thinking about culture. Right? Uh, maybe uh, Ainsi par la l'oncle could be seen as an early form of Afro-pessimism, right? a movement uh, that has arisen recently in response to uh, 
uh, to uh, racist ideology in this country. So, in a way, Ainsi par la l'oncle is bearing the burden of, of this imposed inequality that was a new thing for Haitians in, in 1916. I will think about, uh, about this in light of the writing of Édouard Glissant, who coincidentally was born in the year that Ainsi par la l'oncle was first published. Right? Glissant, who died just a few years ago, is uh, a poet, a critic, a theorist of, of cultures. And uh, in his writing, a tremendously complex and interesting body of writing, uh, you find a repudiation of those hardened boundaries. Right? So Glissant, you know, you might say he had the good fortune to live in a period when, uh, when the boundaries could be seen as fluid. You know, maybe for certain people in certain situations, um, he he would be one of those people who who uh, made boundaries fluid and uh, and uh, walked through a lot of boundaries, and in his uh, Poetics of Relation, I think a, a really important book. He uh, he draws a kind of a chiasmus, as as we like to say in the profession, right? Sort of the A of B and the B of A, that kind of construction, around the idea of the thought of the other and the other of thought. Right? And the thought of the other, he says, is sometimes imperiously assumed by the dominators, or else taken up in suffering by those who endure and seek freedom. Right, that second clause, I think, would describe the position of Pris Miles in, uh, in accusing uh, his, uh, his compatriots of collective bovarisme. The other of thought, says Glissant, is always set in movement by a multiple confluence, where each one is changed by and changes the other. Right? So the thought of the other with a capital O is, you know, it's a kind of a labeling in which we already know in advance what people can be because we know what they are, right? We have a kind of a preset notion of authenticity that limits their possible realizations. The other of thought is basically a big question mark, right? People coexisting influence one another, they adopt each other's uh, hypotheses to see what happens. Uh, the outcomes, you never know. So I think of Glissant as, uh, as being the ideal dialogue partner for the very dejected and pessimistic Prismaus. So here's some terms that I sort of want to put in, in circulation together, right? Authenticity, identity, difference, and suspicion, right? The suspicion of someone who is accused of, being, of behaving in an inauthentic way, right? Uh, and I think these are some, some themes that, uh, that we can see active in the 1920s in Haiti and which we could perhaps also use to diagnose some of the, uh, some of the unease of our present cultural moment, right, in which uh, accounts of identity, uh, to my way of thinking anyway, are, seem to be hardening. And, you know, I'm somebody who prefers for identities to be flexible and open-ended. Um, so I think of, of Glissant as the person who uh, wants to have authenticity, identity, and difference, but doesn't welcome suspicion into, uh, into the conversation. And I want to add one last thing out of Gautier, because uh, it's, uh, you know, Franz Fanon says, uh, you know, be aware, when people talk about the Jews, they're also talking about you, meaning black people. Right? Uh, writing in the 40s and 50s, uh, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-black ideology tended to go together. Um, and here, uh, Gautier and Van Gennep both sneer at cosmopolitanism, right? At the idea that I was just voicing, by the way, that people should uh, have open boundaries and engage with one another and treat each other as citizens of the world rather than as prisoners of a limited identity. That idea, Gautier and Van Gennep had no patience for at all. And Gautier even suspects that humanitarian and cosmopolitan ideals are a sneaky trick invented by the Jews to manipulate 
the authentic populations of Europe, as they would say. Right? So uh, anti-Semitism here is a suspicion that you know, the Jews have developed this ideology and they don't even believe it. They're merely using it to manipulate the rest of the world, right? So kind of a sinister conspiracy theory. Well, you know, conspiracy theory, alas, goes together with the hardening of boundaries too, right? When you're living behind a hardened boundary, you are inevitably uh, inclined to be suspicious of the people on the other side of the boundary and think that even if they're making a gesture of friendship or of welcome, that it's got to be fake, it's got to be a trick. And Van Gennep, uh, he doesn't even bother to make a complete sentence out of it. He says, oh, the blacks of the United States and the, uh, and the Caribbean, parenthesis, humanitarianism, human rights, etc. Right? I suspect that Van Gennep, writing in 1908, might have uh, participated in the World uh, Exhibition of 1900 in Paris, where W.E.B. Du Bois had a stand where he was, uh, he was teaching the world about the progress made by black people in America with lots of graphs. If you, if you get the New York Review of Books, for example, they had a, a lovely article recently that showed a lot of the visual techniques that Du Bois had evolved because you know this world exposition uh, had a lot of visitors from many countries, not all of whom spoke English or French, and so he thought visual representation uh, would be a good way to address those, uh, those audiences. And he made extremely elegant graphics uh, to talk about things like property owning, literacy, uh, uh, income, and so forth. So I suspect that Van Gennett might have seen Du Bois's proofs that black people were not doomed to some kind of a, an, an infinite inferiority, but could do perfectly well anything that anybody else on earth could do. And by alluding to this humanitarianism and human rights stuff without even addressing it, simply by dismissing it in a parenthesis, uh, Van Gennep is kind of showing you where he stands. Right? So anyway, um, these are all dimensions of, of this situation, uh, this conflict-ridden situation in which uh, people are doubting their, their own patterns for cultural identity and seeking other ones, uh, sometimes seeking them somewhat desperately, and all of that I see as being condensed in the citation of this phrase, collective bovarisme. I tried to show you how it's not just uh, restricted to Pris Mars, but involves this network of allusions to uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat controversial texts and how it's useful to be able to restore some of that context and see, see why this would have been puzzling and scandalous for, for uh, Haitian readers in 1928. All right, so anyway, that's what I had to say. And um, I welcome your questions. Okay, so almost the same time as uh, Madame Bovary was written a book Anna Karenina by Lev Tolstoy. Right. And they have interesting um, kind of uh, parallels. Mm -hmm. They both have lovers. Right. They both kill themselves. But as you explain, it was more material reasons for Madame Bovary and some spiritual reasons for uh, Anna Karenina. And uh, because they were written, I believe, very similar time, nobody knows what was first and who was potentially new. But so when you discuss this, you discuss this as cultural phenomena, that bavarisma is uh, some kind of state of mind mm -hmm. that not uh, accept real for some kind of fictional. But you cannot um, say this about Anna Karenina, in a sense. Nevertheless, it is considered that these two books very similar and basically based on um, kind of uh, repressed situation with women mm -hmm. rather than cultural phenomenon not accept reality versus fiction. Mm -hmm. So how would you comment on this? Yeah. Um, so, you know, 
I mean, Gautier has his particular take on Bovarisme as this reign of illusion. Uh, in that regard, I think Anna Karenina is a completely different sort of book, right? Because she's living in a world with a lot more people, right? One of the things that makes Madame Bovary so miserable is that she has nobody to talk to, right? And even her lovers basically use her and discard her. Uh, but, you know, with Anna Karenina, she's, she's got, uh, you know, friends, right? Her, her relationship with, uh, you know, with Kitty and with Levin and all these people goes on for years and years, and there's a lot of engagement. And in a way, her friends represent alternative lives that she might have lived, right? And Madame Bovary, poor thing, doesn't get to see that. The only alternative life she has is in these fantasy novels, right? So she never really gets to see, you know, what it would be to be a happy person, for example, right? Um, so, you know, in that way, I think uh, Tolstoy might be responding to Madame Bovary by saying, you know, okay, Flaubert, you, you have a kind of a test tube sample of an unhappy person, but, you know, unhappy people are also connected to a lot of other people and they have more going on in their lives than you allowed your character to have. You know, that, that's sort of a, a sketch of how it might be. But, you know, there is this whole genealogy of, of unhappy women who you know, seek happiness and are denied it. You know, Effie Brist, right, by, uh, by Fontana is another one, and, and so on. So um, there, there's a kind of a typology there, but I think all of these people are in some way responding to one another, not to mention the novels that are written by women, which you know, also throw in different, uh, different plot lines, different, uh, different forms of unhappiness and different ways of escaping it. Yeah. So our next online question starts with the observation that uh, Priest Mouse found the source of authentic Haitian identity in the experience of slavery. Um, and how would you assess this? And how might insights like this relate to the critique of Bovarisma? Yeah. Uh, so with that, we're, we're delving into the book, Ainsi par la l'oncle, which uh, is a book that absolutely repays scrutiny. So. Uh, uh, Prismal says, yeah, you know, the stories and the fables that, are, uh, that were created by the Haitian peasantry come out of the experience of first slavery and then poverty, uh, because alas, after the, the, uh, the French were kicked out, uh, society in Haiti still remained massively unequal, with a lot of peasants tilling the soil and a very few people getting the profits. And these stories are uh, very often trickster stories, right, in which the weaker person overcomes the stronger, right? And so he knows this, right? He says, you know, trickster stories are, of course, universal, right? You have, you know, trickster stories in every culture on, on Earth, but they had a particular meaning in Haiti. And also, uh, the Haitian version of these stories, where Buki and Timalis are, are arguing, uh, it's, uh, it puts on stage sort of the, the rural person versus the urban person, also a, a very strong polarity in that society. So uh, it's, it's a book that, that uh, yeah, it replaces one set of concerns, this kind of Franco-centric set of concerns, with a bunch of concerns that are vital to people who are living on the island. Hello and thank you. Um, question, I'm a little unclear on your line that you draw in with racism in specific. To me, just tell someone from Sierra Leone they can't be French or someone from France they can't be Sierra Leonese. It's not necessarily racist as much as a reflection of the reality of the situation. I speak French, I'll never speak French like a French person. In this case, where you draw the line or where the Gaultier drew the line or did he or other people at that time, more 19th century context than today. Right, right. Yeah, so, uh, Gautier, you know, he's, he's anti-Semitic, but he's not anti-black. He doesn't even notice uh, the black uh, populations. Uh, but it's, um, it's Van Gennep who's, uh, who's the one that uh, is, is using Liberia as example. Right? And his, his case is one where he thinks, you know, it's just abject failure, right? It's not just a matter of somebody not accepting your accent, but uh, you know, the complete, complete collapse of a society. Now, th this is actually not an accurate portrayal of Liberia in the 19th century, but, uh, you know, the kind of thing that would be marshaled uh, 
uh, as, as a kind of a racist argument. I mean, I remember quite recently uh, hear, or seeing in, in certain uh, journals uh, the idea that uh, the moment the Chinese took over Hong Kong, the elevators would stop running in the high towers of Kowloon. You know, you could see this in, uh, published in opinion columns of you know, fairly respectable English language papers, right? I mean, Chinese people are perfectly able to run a power plant and to keep the elevators in good repair, please. You know, they've been doing it for a long time. But, but you know, the fact that somebody could, could utter this and, and not be questioned uh, by, by the editor of that journal, at least, uh, says something, right, about, uh, about the survival of these notions that, that race is destiny, right? So anyway, the and in, in 19th century Europe, you know, you did have this, uh, this rise of racially motivated thinking, right? Gobineau is uh, the, the most conspicuous one, but, you know, um, there's a whole genealogy that Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism gives us. It's a long and uh, very dismaying chapter in which every, every obnoxious thing <laughs> that, that a 19th century European said about people who are not like him is uh, strung out for our observation. And what's powerful in Arendt is that she shows the connection of those ideas to 20th century tyrannies that you know, might not have directly, some, in some cases they were directly indebted to this racist discourse, and in some cases they weren't. But sort of it creates structures in which certain groups of people are less than human that allow those people then to be treated you know, as, uh, as uh, basically as cannon fodder or raw material or whatever. Uh, so anyway, Arendt is a, an indispensable reference for all this. So we have one other online question. Oh, okay. uh, just ask that. Elizabeth Brown um, asked if you could you could place the tension you mentioned between Boverism and authentic Haitian nationality um, into conversation with a somewhat similar discussion going on between Alain Locke and Dubois in the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are many variants on uh, on the question of you know what what will authenticity be for African Americans, and sure, Alain Locke in his book uh, The New Negro and W. B. Du Bois with the Souls of Black Folk coming out a little bit earlier, you know they they both uh, give uh, a sort of a literary form to the to the uh, dilemmas that that confront. Uh, black people in the U.S., right? Not just for material survival, but for you know spiritual survival and for uh, cultural identity. Uh, the book where I like to explore these issues is by James Weldon Johnson. It's a, a novel called Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, and what I love about this is that it's it's written not in the mode of philosophical essays or sociological investigations. Uh, but of, of a kind of a picaresque narrative where there's one character who travels around the U.S. It's a, he's a mixed rape, race person who can pass for either. And so in different places, he has different adventures that open up different doors to him. And uh, in the course of his adventures, he also manages to utter a lot of the sociological and philosophical thinking that was on the minds of, of these people. So. Um, I would, you know, I, I think the, the Haitians are confronted with a lot of the same issues, but uh, because of their more than 100 year history of self government before the U.S. Marines uh, disembarked, I, I think the contrast was more, uh, more vivid and, and striking, right? That's why it's called the generation of the slap. Right? So, uh, another reason for paying attention to Haiti. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you, Han, for uh, is this Han? Anyway, for uh, giving us lots to think about. Um, also, in in relation to the current moment, and you alluded to that, uh, it was sort of between the lines, I thought. And I want to pose a, a situation to see what you think, um, in which the hardening of boundaries is regarded by some as as progressive. Um, so um, I'm, I hope I don't murder the anecdote, but there there was an article about uh, I think a uh, some kind of high school gathering where a white girl showed up wearing a chief hao, a Chinese dress, 
and a couple of Asian American girls were very much offended. Now there, I, th I think among young people and among Asian Americans, there are two views. So for example, my children who are Asian American um, thought it was absurd that they would object to someone uh, who didn't have the right blood, I guess, wearing something like that. But then there are others as who see themselves as very progressive and who think that it, that is correct. You absolutely should not appropriate, right, uh, anything from any other culture that differs from, I guess, from your blood type. Or so anyway, I'm wondering, you must have thought about this, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so maybe yeah. you can unpack that a little bit. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, want to engage it uh, too frontally, right? I wanted to go in a sideways sort of fashion because, um, you know, I recognize the, uh, the despair that's behind such movements as Afro-pessimism and others. And I also see them as uh, sort of invoking the most, uh, the most unwelcoming possible account by non-black people of black people and using that as a kind of a basis, right? I mean, you know, um, uh, there are people who say, you know, as white people define human, blacks can never be human, right? And that, you know, I read that with, a, with horror in my soul, right? I you know, can't believe that that's literally the case, but it is, you know, absolutely literally the case for many other observers, right? And I don't want to discount their experience and observation. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think like Chris Mouse, you know, he was using this racist text that he was borrowing from very conscientiously as a way of sort of giving his readers uh, a harsh awakening to a hostile world, right? If you, uh, you know, if you want to believe that everyone, everyone likes you and you're, you know, you're destined for happiness, uh, that might not prepare you for some of the harsh situations that you'd find yourself in. So uh, in that way, I see, I see him as, as instrumentalizing this, this racist discourse without necessarily taking it on. But, you know, it's just in the way of a quotation, right? A quotation carries with it some of its, uh, some of its original context and roots. Um, about the qi pao, I actually have something else to say about that, which is that, of course, qi pao are not Chinese. Yeah. They're Manchu, right? And everybody's forgotten. I mean, the word qi, you know, means Manchu, right? So you know what I'm talking about, the, the high-buttoned, uh, tight dress. Uh, for Ming Dynasty people, that was totally the thing that nomads on the northern frontier who were non-Chinese wore, right? And so Ming Dynasty people would have been shocked that it becomes the property of the Chinese nation. So there's an irony there, right? There, there's a boundary that became totally fluid because one group, formerly very prominent, the Manchus, simply disappeared from history and their cultural property was available for appropriation by anyone in China. But then beyond that boundary, there's another boundary, right, in which some people would say, you don't look right in a chi pao, you're not supposed to wear it. Right. So anyway, I think the, you know, the issues of cultural pr appropriation are not to be dismissed lightly. Um, but uh, I, you know, I tend to be more of a, of a borrower and a let borrow sort of person. You know, I think there are lessons that people in every culture can learn from every other culture. And that might sound like a very, a very anodyne thing to say, but uh, you know, it, in some way, it's kind of you know the end game for me, right? Is for cultural goods to be shared widely, right? But there's a lot of history behind that. Too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's not going to be problem free. <laughs> so we have another online question that's really about you, Han. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> so how did how, the questioner asks how this this interesting line of investigation that you shared with us today? How does that relate to your day job in Chinese literature? Uh, well, um, in one way, uh, I, gosh, this sounds like a question that that I could have almost dictated as a softball question because it allows me to do some some advertising for my forthcoming book. <laughs> Uh, which is called The Making of Barbarians, and it's about the history of uh, Chinese culture's relations to its immediate outsides, right? How Chinese uh, borrowed from and didn't borrow from 
Manchus, Mongolians, Tibetans, Uyghurs, uh, southern tribal peoples, and so forth. And so it just traces a line through literary texts from you know, around 1000 BC to 1850, uh, talking about you know, how, how you formulate a language to talk about the outsiders. So in a way, you know, this, is, this is a question that's on my mind, uh, whether I'm dealing with Asian texts or Caribbean texts or things that we're uh, experiencing and debating about right here and now. So thank you for coming. I'm really glad to have had a chance to share these thoughts with you. And my email address is easily found if anyone has other questions or wants to discuss anything. I would love nothing more. Thank you.